right into the reports to the board. And... All right, so uh, you have my uh, superintendent report um, in hand. I mean, I would I would add that, and I mentioned it in the report um, that we've had COVID nineteen positivity, uh, specifically on the Bethel campus. Um, the way that this typically works is that we have positivity. Um, we, we do our contact tracing and then you have to wait for testing to occur. And based on close contacts, it's typically been um, the case where we have additional positivity. So that is where we're at right now. Um, we have a, a lot of siblings in our buildings and things of that nature. So sometimes that's the case where a sibling will turn up positive. Um, and so what I would say to you is, is that we continue to navigate this via pods in grade levels, specifically at the elementary in the middle school. Um, frankly, if this was at the high school right now, we might have a different situation where we're just pausing and going remote. Um, we still have a, a pretty significant situation that without the state of emergency, that unless we have 51% of the student body in the building, I can't count it as a, a school day. And so we would be then wrestling with that if we felt like we were at a place that we had a, enough contacts at an example at the high school level, we may need to pause for a day while we do contact tracing before we bring students back. If I was to pause for that day at this point, that would just be no school. So I just wanted to clarify that with the board. Um, we can go remote and we mark attendance as remote present. So I am keeping track of that when we go remote with a grade level, with the hope being that guidance is going to change at some point, that when we go remote, that those students actually will count toward the 51%. At this point, I don't have that clarification, nor do I think it's worth us risking when we look at, um, we have a master agreement that specifies the number of days that our faculty can work. Um, and so I know there's been, I've had a few emails and I've responded directly to them. I will clarify this with the community next week. Some superintendents have chosen to go remote. Everybody has a different master agreement. So some master agreements, for example, Washington Central have 180 student days. You only have to go 175 without requesting a waiver. So they had a little flexibility to roll that dice. So even if they, when they went remote, those days weren't counted, teachers worked them, students learned. They wouldn't be in a situation um, with management versus the, you know, the negotiated master agreement that they may then have to be paying people per diem and or working on a site agreement to bring folks back in. So we have two days with a little flexibility, but that's it. Uh, we contract for 177 student days. Um, so we have less flexibility in that regard. So I just wanted to try to provide a little clarity uh, specifically for RUD in the sense of all the other schools, close contacts typically are limited to a grade level. At our high school, that wouldn't be the case. So we may have to shut down for a day while we did contact tracing and then we would ramp back up. Um, so I hope that, that that provides some additional clarity. Ray, I saw you looking like you wanted to talk. Oh, okay. No, uh, just um, everybody who's as far away as Jamie is, just talk a little bit louder. All right, sorry, I apologize about that. Um, any questions? Um, one thing I'd be wondering about is, like if we did have a lot of contacts or worries about specific worries about COVID, if, if we could change our in-person, um, like have everybody spend the day outside, distanced, you know, we, we got all these tents and stuff, like would it be possible to do a lot more outside to when we're worried about it to make sure that it doesn't? I think we definitely want to leverage outdoor learning as much as possible in being outside. I would say if we're in the midst of contact tracing, we definitely wouldn't bring people in. Right, because we wouldn't want to bring close contacts into the building. Right, what I mean, what I mean is like, you know you've had close contacts, so you've got to stay at home. 
but there's other people and you're concerned that they're like there could be you know i think you know what i mean where like you've asked the close contacts to stay home but there is a potential like siblings or something like that could be getting into other classrooms you know like yeah, so it's on the agenda about outdoor classroom time. I, I met with the principals today to talk about that. Um, I think they're prepared to talk about what we're doing around outdoor learning. Um, I would say we are trying to leverage outdoor learning as much as possible um, with the fact that, especially at the elementary levels, with the fact that we're still down staff. That's a reality, which is impacting our ability, for example, to even have coverage to do lunch outside in certain buildings because I don't have the folks to cover um, the lunchtime blocks and ensure that I can provide teachers with their duty-free lunch. So that's something we're trying to navigate right now as we're trying to still increase staffing. Um, and then also, of course, at the elementary level specifically, teachers are working really diligently to try to teach routines, which will include outdoor time, but we are still just in our first full week of school so I think especially for our primary grades, like K-1-2, uh, they're still in the midst of that as well. Uh, but certainly we want to leverage outdoor learning. I think the principals will be able to speak to that under that discussion. I, know, I would agree with that, Andrew. I was more thinking like, yeah, Peggy's here, so we'll start the meeting in earnest. But I was more thinking, you know, like, what do you have? Like if we have different alert levels or something like that, you know, you've mm -hmm. got your remote, everything's closed, then we've got our, some portion is closed, but yeah, like if we have some alert level where we change some of the things that we do, try and really mitigate the risk. I like the concept, and I'll bring it back to the COVID team to see if we can put that into like a procedure. So that's it's clear cut. Like everything else so far, we know what we do when we do it, and so right. I'll think about if there's a different approach to that when we know that we have additional concerns for the specific building. Okay. All right. So with Peggy here, um, we'll. Oh, okay. Awesome. All right. Hello. Yeah, I'm here. Um, we'll go to the start of our agenda now. Um, do we have any adjustments to the agenda while we're? Uh, I was just going to mention to the board. Um, we actually have a few candidates for your vacant position. So in the past, you've interviewed and then gone into an executive session and came out and appointed. So I don't know if you want to move 8.4 down to after the outdoor classroom time. Do you see what I'm saying? And then put an executive session in the middle of that um, and then appoint. Sure. Yeah, well, yeah. Or is there, are all the candidates able to hang around or like would it be? Better to get it done at the beginning, and then we can decide. If we have two candidates. Are you guys cool with hanging around? Yeah, fine. Yeah. Okay. So we'll move eight four to eight six. I'd, I'd like to, if it's appropriate, uh, to introduce the two student council representatives who are with us tonight from the high school. Alex Kennison is a tenth grader, and Grace Collin is eleventh grader. Um, and uh, I'm glad to have their voice here to report to the board and. Uh, answer questions about what's going on at the high school and be able to bring information from uh, our work together here back to the student body. They were elected last spring uh, in this uh, school-wide election. So excited that they're willing to be here and give up their evening to, to learn more about school board work and uh, how boards function and more about being a citizen and, and leader in our democracy. Welcome you guys. Very happy to have you. Um, okay. Any other adjustments to the agenda? Okay. Um, do we have public comments at this time? All right, hearing none, um, we're going to move to um, our consent agenda. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the minutes of August 17th? From, um, the yeah. two meetings, the special the retreat and the regular meeting. I would make a motion to pass those two um, minutes. I am. And I'll second it. Okay. Any discussion? Okay. 
Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. Uh, do we have any board comments this time? Okay. Um, Jamie, did you have more on your superintendent's report? No, other than just I wanted to say that the buildings are feeling in the due to the fact that we are still faced with a pandemic, which I think a lot of folks were hoping we were going to be in a much better place than we are right now. And the fact that we are short staffed, I want to say that the staff is doing an incredible job. They're unbelievably dedicated. They're flexible. They're working tirelessly to provide the best education for our kids they can. And our buildings feel positive. Um, I was in this building several times last week. I've been in South Royalton now several times. I was there after school today talking to teachers. In general, morale is up based on what I can read through firsthand conversations and folks are working incredibly hard. But I do want to acknowledge it's really difficult work. Um, and I just want the board to keep that in mind. Um, and I know you do, but just anytime we can thank a teacher, please do. Because uh, it's really challenging right now. Jamie, I know we talked about this at the last meeting. How many staff are we down right now? Um, well, we're down. It's all in the special ed department, and so, and and we will talk to you about and in your admin assistant at the South Burlington campus. So, for you directly run reports. It really is, uh, we're still looking for a part-time math interventionist here based on some shuffling that we did, we hired internally, which freed up that math inter interventionist position. So you're still looking for a 0.5 math interventionist at the middle school level, and we need two admin assistants at South Royalton. Um, as far as support staff go across the SU, which do, does impact you, we still would like to hire four support staff um, and some of that has to do with move-ins, frankly, too, um, in the sense that we had some students move in with some additional significant need. Um, so on top of being short staff, we had some folks move in that needed more intensive supports. So we're still looking for our paras there. And we would like to hire three special educators uh, for the supervisory union. I think we may have one coming on board hopefully next week um, that we'll have hired and get started here in the next couple weeks. I would say I'm much more uh, confident in our ability to fill out support staff at this time. I'm uh, not optimistic about special educators. There's a sh shortage across the state. But in addition to that, folks who have entered contracts are locked in. So now we're really looking at folks who maybe were thinking about going into special education and have decided, yeah, maybe they'll take the jump. And we support them with their licensure. Or we're looking at someone moves in from out of state, or someone's retired and decides to come back from the field. Um, so I would say to you, I, I'm still very optimistic about the other positions. Um, and principal has been interviewing for your admin assistant positions as well. Uh, I'm less um, optimistic right now about the special educator shortage. And I really do believe that in general, that is a state issue that we need the agency to help us with. Um, around recruitment um, for special educators. It's really hard work. Special education is really hard work. And what I have said to uh, just meeting with the, uh, the union leadership today is that with this influx of money came a lot of intervention positions. And we, we did lose a couple special educators mm -hmm. to become interventionists. And so if I can intervene, right, and support students academically, but not have the case management on top of it, it's really hard to convince someone to go from that type of teaching position to now you're going to intervene and have case management. Um, and that, I think, is part of the battle we're facing as well, is that some special educators in the state decided to become interventionists, but not have the case management. Um, Part of what we've done to stay in compliance is right now we are contracting some services around temporarily for case management and virtual instruction via licensed special educators uh, to try to stay in compliance. So we're still looking to hire the number I just said. 
but do know it's not like that that's just not happening. We have contracted folks um, to do that work. It's not ideal, it's not what we want to do, and on top of that, special educators are being really flexible. And interventionists, and you saw the letter that I wrote, is you know, we gotta make certain we're staying in compliance with IEPs. Um, but certainly as much work as we've tried to do to strengthen our system of supports, uh, frankly, it's not operating at the way I'd like it to because we're just, we don't have the, uh, the number of bodies we need. Um, earlier you said that we didn't have the staff to do like outdoor lunch. We can talk about this later if you want um, during that discussion time. But what you just outlined was more special educators. And those are well, we, we do use paraprofessionals to help with duties. Okay. Right, so when I said we need another four, that's that those four would certainly support with supports of students, but also they help us with those duty coverages. Well, um, is that SU, that was SUY? It was SUY, important. but we would designate two immediately to South Royalton. All right, any other questions for Jamie? Uh, we'll move to the principal's report. Andre, were you going to leave? You rehearsed, right? I can, I'm sorry. Is it getting presented? Yep. For some reason, it's not, it's me, it's me. Okay, um, I think just we wanted to report out on our goals and that uh, we are continuing to roll out our MTSS work. Um, I know you've all probably already read all this, so maybe I don't really need to read it for you. Um, I don't know if people have questions about the first goal and about how we're working on some of this stuff or? If you want me to read it to you, because I'm happy to summarize and read it to you. Andrew, maybe just point out the highlights in each for each goal. Sure. Well, I don't think I get to do them all. I think I get to share. Um, so mostly that uh, we're working hard on our alternative classrooms and uh, making sure that they're supported and more integrated into the school. Um, and so I, I feel like that's going really well. Um, and I feel like there's a lot, we've dialed up the educational opportunities for those those three different classrooms and being able to support a lot of those kids ourselves in-house. Um, yeah. And so I think it just sort of spells out what it looks like within each classroom. So there's a special educator, a lead teacher, and um, we're still working on filling um, these positions, but there's most places have a case manager from Clara Martin also within those classrooms. All right, goal two. Goal, goal two. Um, last Friday, uh, in the elementary schools, students went to stations around the buildings to talk about respect, responsibility, safety, and kindness, the four key principles of our, our PBIS system. Um, it's always a fun day, and you hear some really interesting comments from students about how they think they should behave. And, uh, what it means to, to be in different parts of the room. Like, I overheard one one student's, when they went into the principal's office to, to learn about how to behave in the office, uh, one of the students explained, I knew the wildcat wasn't real. Uh, it was just kind of a priceless moment. Uh, the other thing we've got going on is uh, at the high school, we finished our first uh, lead em up unit. Well, and tomorrow we, we transition to the next one. I don't know if either one of our students want to share with the board what, what that's all about, or we could wait till we uh, student role on the board later. You guys want to say anything about Lead Them Up and what we're doing? Uh, sure. We were working on, uh, what is that? Basically, self assessment on how you're coming to school and your participation and overall respect to everyone around you and how you conduct yourself and I feel like that's actually been 
really helpful as I was sitting in classrooms, uh, listening to everybody talking about what would be like not good examples of how to behave. And some people were actually like pointing out that uh, it was not great experiences when that had ever happened. So we were discussing on how to make that better. And I feel like some people actually took it to art and trying to build a better community all together is really what we're working on. And Thanks, Alex. Uh, another, another big focus in there, our goal too, is uh, our work towards personalizing learning through flexible pathways. Uh, so we've really expanded the work we have, we're doing with students, uh, both in the middle school and the high school. Uh, really exciting to be looking at new models that uh, I, I think are not just out of the box, but maybe just like kind of knocking down the box uh, and really, really creating some some different ways for students to learn and access their education. Uh, so uh, we had a consultant in at the high school on uh, Friday afternoon during our in service. Uh, Alicia Rominger who used to work with Jamie in Williamstown, and uh, she worked with some of our, our teachers who have uh, some small groups of students in that personalized uh, learning model as we, we try to get them uh, an alternative to the traditional curriculum uh, in a way that allows them to be successful uh, where maybe there have been challenges before. So uh, we're really excited about that. Uh, and our personalized learning classroom space is, uh, is going pretty well. Uh, we're still missing our flexible pathways coordinator, which is a, a key piece in this whole program. Uh, but despite that, uh, we're still making progress. So. We're excited about that, and I hand it to Owen to talk about the big community news. Well, <clears throat> good evening, everybody, and uh, I look forward to being with you tonight. Uh, I'll review goal three, and as you know, it's expanding our community outreach in ways that help us effectively engage and partner with students, parents, and our broader community. You know, a big part of uh, what we got this booster is a, a major grant for one of five uh, groups that school groups that got this grant in a super short timeline and really great help from some community members and from central office of making sure this happened. We're pretty excited about what's going to come out of this. This is a three year grant and we see it as a way to extend what we're doing with the community and broaden it. We're also so you know working with uh mclean as a as a communications person and she's helped us including with a press release for this and i've embedded that in this grant i'm i'm it's in the but in the um agenda for a little later so i i think it might be appropriate for me to either take questions now or i'm happy to wait when it comes up in the agenda you'll all love it you may have heard about all of this through um, the Herald or Facebook. Um, yeah, why don't we get into that once, once we get to it on the agenda? Uh, do we have any questions for the principals about the non grant side of things? So, something that's happened since the report was written is that we had a meeting of the Performing Arts Center Committee, uh, which is parents uh, and, and staff. Uh, and Grace is one of the students on that committee. I don't know, Grace, if you want to give everybody a snapshot of, of what the Performing Arts Committee is doing and where we're at. Yeah, so we just had our first meeting uh, last week, and we met with the two architects that will be heading up the um, project and we kind of talked about budget, we talked about um, the design, we talked about the location, and we kind of just like set all the ground rules really before we start moving on with the whole thing. So I, I've always kind of thought in my head that this might be a, a three year or longer project to see to fruition, but after meeting with the architects on Friday, uh, it sounds like they think they can turn something around pretty quickly to, to be in a in a development phase. Again, we got a grant for $23,000 uh, to engage architects to come up with a concept. 
Uh, and so with the community partnership, we'll, we'll work on that concept and then have something that we can bring around to you for your approval. Um, and, and then once we have gotten that, uh, you know, begin the development phase to try to find some private uh, funders who might want to put their name on the Performing Arts Center at the high school. Um, and the architects thought this this could be from now until 18 months so we could have a Performing Arts Center, which seemed like a really aggressive timeline. But it's pretty exciting to think that uh, students who are sophomores now could be uh, having the benefit of a much improved art space uh, for performances their senior year. Grace may unfortunately miss out on that, but maybe she'll come back and wish. Great. Well, that sounds, sounds great. Um, okay, if nobody has any more questions for the principal, we'll move on to the business manager report. Good evening, everyone. You have my report. We'll move down to the discussion items. I shared with you by email last week our current FY21 year-end projections prior to any adjusting audit entries, which we are currently undergoing audit as we speak right now. Um, revenue was $11,939,913.63. Your expenditures were $10,555,319.20. Leaving a projected surplus in the general fund of one million three hundred eighty-four thousand five hundred ninety-four dollars and forty-three cents. Taking your deficit from FY twenty in the general fund of three hundred ninety-nine thousand one hundred and fifty-one dollars, it's leaving you with a current projected general fund balance at the close of FY twenty-one of nine hundred eighty-five thousand four hundred and forty-three dollars. Any questions on that? Um, I mean, that's that's pretty great um, that we've kind of turned it around that much. Um, I am a little worried about um, how far off we were from the projections. I mean, it's great to be off in this direction, but um, you know, like our last projected surplus was going to be around uh, like four hundred to five hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars. So. Going from that to 1.3 is, you know, a good surprise, but it'd be nice to not have surprises. Um, so. so that was a lot of that was, Andrew, we still had to reconcile the closing out of the ESSER and CRF funds for FY21, as well as the additional grant funds and where we were able to offset general fund expenses. So that work still needed to be done. Um, when I provided that last projection. So that's part of this additional change is the additional um, federal funding that we had available to the district. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I just, like I think we, yeah. This is definitely a strange year with, with the uh, COVID relief funds and all that stuff, but yeah. That's just my one comment on it. But it is really nice that we're able to get that done. And I know this is a combination of those relief funds, but also a lot of hard work by the staff and administration to really um, focus on our fiscal footing. So congratulate you guys on that. I think um, when we come to budget calendar and stuff, like if, you know, once this is audited, which is good, the audit's underway. So we'll get, you know, confirmation. But certainly then we need to talk about paying off food service debt, mm -hmm. right, that we've been carrying in that enterprise fund, um, which will be good. And then talking about, as we build the budget for next year, the idea of going to the town to actually put some money away now in reserve funds. Um, as we discussed, I think that we've still got SR3, which we have not even tapped into yet. We were hoping to use more of that to do, um, you know, work within the building. And I think we can do some of that work in the building, although there seems to be more and more pressure from the agency to use that to deal with um, 
focused on uh, student achievement and learning about uh, regression. And so what I think we need to do is, is just strategically, um, both at this district, but across the SU, make some determinations around and communicate to our communities that we've got some additional revenue that we may be using to offset what would typically be local costs that we would keep in the budget, and that's permissible with ESSER 3 you can supplant. But looking to build up our building reserve funds to do the needed work that we have to around delayed maintenance. So I just think as we're talking about this, the communication plan for that will be critical. Mm -hmm. um, and it's why we try to leverage as much ESSER 2 as we could in CRF to build up a surplus to not only pay off your debt, but knowing that we had some pretty big capital improvements that we needed to do. Um, so I just, I think in general, those are, those are things that we have to continue to communicate and help folks understand. I mean, this is exciting news and I want to be excited about this, but we have been through some wild oscillations. Absolutely. And so it makes it, I don't know, it makes me just question until we get the audit. Agreed. And that's why we're doing the audit, right? Right. But tentatively happy about this. I, mean, I think the way, I guess what I'm wrapping my head around right now yeah. is that we're in the black. So as your superintendent, yeah. I'm wrapping my head around that we're in the black, that I believe we're going to pay off our debt, and that hopefully we'll have some money to set aside for capital mm -hmm. improvements. That's that's where I'm at as far as wrapping my head around it at this point. Um, and then as the audit gets completed, then we'll have real numbers and confirmed numbers. Uh, the good news is the audit's happening this week, and so we'll have those during the budget making season. Yeah, because how are things looking with like the pace of the audit process? Is it, does it look like things are hopefully going more on schedule and on time with what Jared can speak more specific. Happening? I'm feeling confident that we're going to be all right. So they're starting with the SU as that's the main entity that then has impact on each of the member districts. The audit officially started yesterday so they are working through the auditors will be here in our office wednesday thursday friday of this week they like i said their primary focus is to start with the su and then they'll work through each of the member districts as they go through that process so as of right now um, we are on target with our schedule how's how's the projection for the su looking too because i guess that's one that depending on what direction that goes that will adjust our numbers some too right I'll be sharing that with the full board next week. Yeah, I mean, the, the SU is looking at like, and Tara can jump in. The last I knew is we were looking at a break even. Okay. Not a significant direction either way, but right around break even, which you're right, has significantly impacted you in the past. You're 44% of the SU share. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, do you think at some point we will be able to have something like the projection that you had where we list out exactly what that 1.3 million is kind of composed of? Um, and more than just like the budget thing, but like, you know, this teacher, this whatever, those kind of things. Yeah, you mean like we were doing the two-page projection? Yes. Like get into the nitty-gritty about what actually resulted in the surplus? Right. Once it's confirmed, yeah, and we could do that. And then the plan is to give you that type of projection quarterly as well for this year. Just because it wasn't adjusting much, and I felt like we were reaching at times to change the projection, but I'd rather it be a, a true projection and have it be quarterly. If you want your statements monthly, you can get those on top of it. But I think to try to project, uh, a projection to me would be quarterly. And again, we can give you your expenditure reports monthly. And the finance committee can talk more in depth about that. But in general, I felt like at times that wasn't changing much. And I just wanted to, again, like you said, Andrew, be as accurate as possible and be a projection. Right, but presumably like this, I would think that this is kind of a living document where, you know, you have somebody who is, you know, you have, Staffing changes, you update that document with how that's going to impact the budget. Not necessarily like once a quarter, say, okay, what have we done? I would think it would be more. I, I'm happy to when a change comes, bring it to you. 
Okay. And it's just a living document. You can have monthly. Just know that it may not change. Right. I think there was boards expecting it was going to change every month. So just knowing that it may not change. And yeah, that could be like we talk about it at the finance committee and then yeah. yep. quarterly we talk about it here. Yeah. Yeah, and I just want to say I do appreciate that the administration, the teachers, everyone has really pulled together to be fiscally responsible, knowing that we had the deficit that we had. And I I think that led to some of the projected surpluses that we were talking about that were much more conservative than this. So I appreciate that sort of community response in a really challenging time. Um, does anybody have any more questions for Tara? All right, um, we're going to get a report from the policy committee. You were at the most recent policy committee meeting. I didn't make the second one where we looked at Oh, you weren't at the last right. one. Right. That was this a, Andrew and I. Yeah. Her. Uh, sure. Uh, hello. So I guess at the last policy committee meeting, there were some revisions to the, I guess the main topic was the, uh, I can't even remember the official name of it, the, 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 the policy on equity. Anti-racism. Anti-racism uh, <coughs> policy. And so there's, there's a draft, a fifth draft, I guess that will be coming up for us to review. It's out. It's out. Yeah. We should have got it the full yeah. I sent it to the full board. Okay. Right. Weeks the, it'll be in your packet again though for next next week's meeting. Oh yeah, the full SC board meeting. Okay. So it's on the website too, if folks want to want to reference it. Uh, the process would be that we'll be up for discussion at the full board and then see what happens from there and then it would come to us. As the local board, once the full board considers it. Yep. Any, any questions or anything on the policy committee? Okay. Um, moving on to our discussion items. Um, the, we'll go with eight one, the task force developments, the pre K and recruitment and marketing. Um, as far as I know, we haven't really done anything on this yet, right? No, so I guess what I was looking to, uh, we talked to his uh, admin, um, and so Andrew's willing to be the admin rep on the pre-K committee, that just seemed natural. Uh, and Owen would take the lead on the marketing and uh, re recruitment slash marketing task force. Um, and so what we need to just get a sense from the board is how many board members wanted to join I think we have to have at least one. Um, and then, you know, I really think it's important um, in the pre-K task force to have our pre-K coordinator, Renee Hinton, as part of that conversation. She's new to us. Um, uh, and uh, certainly pre-K teacher, hopefully. Um, and so we'd have a couple of faculty members, but then community. I think we should uh, yeah. solicit community members that have a passion about this to join. Um, to start this important work as a task force. And same thing with recruit, recruitment and marketing, other than I'd like the board to think about extending the invitation around recruitment and marketing to some of the member mm -hmm. towns within the supervisory union to give input on how we could do a better job of communicating uh, to our families because I think that they're the ones that are going to help give us input on how we could be more effective around this. Um, and I will tell you that I've had community members um, reach out to me and principals within the organization who are interested in helping you with this work. Um, and so I think that that perspective would be helpful. And I'd like you to just consider that. Um, yeah, I think that's a good idea. And certainly some students too. Um, I think that in general, I've been saying this, but I don't think I've said it publicly in a board meeting. The sustainability of this supervisory union in our member districts 
is certainly on, for me, the goal of keeping a third of our students within the organization, where we have some control around cost. Um, that is not the case right now. I think that that should be something that the board talks about as a goal, um, both locally and at the SU level, potentially, because um, in general, um, that to me is the best sustainable way forward based into the type of organization we are around many districts within a larger WRVSU. But we do have a central middle and high school. Um, and so, and we know that families are driving by it currently right now, and uh, I think we have a lot to offer. So it's definitely part of the work of um, bringing on someone to help do some additional communication work with Kate McLean. That's part of the ESSER grant, um, and it, she should be on that task force as well because I think she will help us spearhead uh, how do we do a better job of promoting. Because in general, there's some great things happening. Um, but I still don't think outside of our communities that folks know. I'm sorry, what was her name? Kate McLean, Shannon. Kate McLean, okay, thank you. Yep. Do you think it makes sense to look at some of the employers in the Bethel Royalton region and find out the demographics of where their employees are coming from? So when we're looking at two phase recruitment, you know, really focusing on communities where we know the parents are coming to work in our community. I don't know if that's you're saying for members of the on the task force. For members of the task force, yeah. like mm -hmm. just if that's a place to collect data to know where to target some of our efforts. So really, I I just need to know from the board, um, what level of like. Jamie, let's pull this together and get it going. You need from me, right? And the principals, or how much of a leadership role you want to take as each member to pull it together and get it going. Um, that's really what I'm looking for. And when I say Jamie, get it going, I'm going to look to Kate to help me get one of the task force going. Um, and then Andrew, we'll talk to Renee Hinton about assisting us to get the pre K group up and running. But again, if you want to take the lead and say, no, we're going to spearhead that as the board member, that's fine too. I just need to know yeah, what your no, preference is. I, I was going to be the pre-K board member. Um, if anybody else wants to step up on that, I'm happy to let somebody else do it just because, uh, you know, with coaching the middle school, it has been difficult in the fall to find time. Um, but I, I'm still happy to do it, but it would be helpful if somebody could get that organized. Because I do think we need to have that, like in the next couple months, a recommendation of what we want to do, so that we can include it in whatever budget. I don't want to go through another budget season without kind of figuring out what yep. we want to do on that. But because um, otherwise, you know, we're waiting for another year. What I think, uh, in order to pull this together quickly, Andrew, I think it's uh, meeting with Renee. I think she's gung ho to help us do some of this work, and um, I think we just have to be clear that we say to folks. Here's the task force, here are the meeting dates. We just articulate them and we say to folks, if you can commit, just know already, like here's the times we're meeting yeah. and, and we're rolling with it. Do you know what I mean? Like it's a standing regular meeting because I think sometimes what holds us up is, uh, and that's why I want it to be a task force, not a committee of the board, yeah. um, is that we're trying to figure out who can make it. Do we have a quorum? I think we just, we need a task force and go and then allow the task force to come back and report out to the board. That sounds good. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, Jamie, I was the board member on the recruitment side um, and working with Owen, which seems like a dynamic duo right there. We're in trouble. <laughs> <Sure. laughs> but um, it, it, it appears that you have some contacts that are interested if you wanted to work on getting that sort of first meeting set up and then we can take it from there, that that seems like it might work pretty well. Um. Yeah, no, so Shannon, what I'll do is I'll email you and Owen who have shown interest mm -hmm. and run that by you and then we could work on an email. And I think in general too, just a, I think we should put a blurb out to the community yep. of run about both of these. Um, to see if we can solicit some other interest as well. 
Does that make sense too? So it, it just feels sure. like a little bit. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Let's plan to get that out by next week. And the next week we'll get that the letter out. But we'll start to by and that, by, by that and what I mean, just so we're clear, is that we've already identified one of the meeting times because I think that needs to go in the letter. Mm -hmm. so we'll what committing to. Sounds good. Okay, anything else you need from us on that? No, I appreciate it. I, I'm excited. I think that both of these things are really, really important. Yeah. And uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Okay, budgeting calendar. For 2020, 21-22 in overall priorities. Tara, do you want to talk about this? So it's that point of the year again to start our budget process. So in the month of September for the budget timeline, we look to the board to give us um, their bottom line direction so we can start our meetings with the leadership team to start developing the budget as we did last year. So is there any thoughts on the board? I think this is gonna be a, a tricky year because we've got yeah, a million dollar surplus that we gotta figure out, you know. I do do want to think we should set as much as we can into reserve funds um, and use some of it for tax relief. But um, you know it would be nice to be able to get off of the kind of austerity footing that we've been on. Like I'm I'm curious to hear from you guys. You know, we've kind of been on the spending freeze for the last couple of years. Like, do we have pent up stuff that needs to happen at this point as far as supplies or books or whatever else? Um, is that something we should use some of the surplus for now? Or, um, you know, I, I the priority from uh, from board perspective is always to do the best we can while, you know, keeping tax rates under control. So, you know, that is where I'm coming from. But I kind of that's, that would be my two cents. I'm, I'm curious to hear from you guys about, you know, where we're at kind of from your perspective after now that we're kind of through the deficit time. I think after the austerity, especially of last year with the budget freeze that started at the end of the first quarter, uh, that having a budget to spend it all feels really great. Mm -hmm. um, and you know the, the while we we did cut chunks of our budget to to come in where we did with a level funded budget last year um, there are still significant resources in the budget that was passed uh, so i feel good about that I, I think teachers are feeling good that they could you know resupply some supply closets that has really gotten kind of bare in the last uh, especially the last year um, but I think we're also optimistic because this ESSER II grant uh, provides a lot of extra resources that will make it feel like we're making investments in things. Um, for example, uh, there's $30,000 in the ESSER II grant for outdoor education that will be able to really upgrade the outdoor high ropes, low ropes course that's here in Bethel and add some features in South Royalton, which will be really exciting and will have a, a nice high impact. Um, I think our two of our PE teachers went down to Brattleboro and spent the day learning about uh, high ropes courses and uh, they're actually trying to get some help with Green Mountain Power to install uh, some poles to start building stuff. Um, so like that's a, exciting stuff. The other thing is that we've got a lot of money coming in for math. So uh, we're, we're putting in a new math program this year in the elementary school um, and where that would have come out of our normal operating budget. Uh, it's now being paid for with grant money, so we're not going to have to find the money within the budget to pay for new elementary math materials. Um, likewise, at the high school, we've got $20,000 of math supplies, of which $10,000 was written into the budget. So we're going to have you know $10,000 left over in our local budget this year that was supplanted by this ESSER II grant, because we're allowed to supplant with this, where usually grants don't allow you to supplant. So. 
I, I think there's room to, to move and make some, some good investments. At least that's how I feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess, and I don't, and Andrea and, and Owen speak up, I think from where I sit, I think the delayed maintenance of our buildings is something that really concerns me. Um, I think the heating system in here is very urgent. Mm -hmm. uh, we did repair over the summer to get us through this upcoming winter, but I, I would say that Lyle, our consultant, would say that was to get through this winter um, and that he, he that we really need to be planning for what are we doing next summer. Um, and so I think that that's one of those areas um, that we're going to be thinking about. The full board is going to hear me talk about PCB testing that is starting to happen across the state. I'm uh, concerned about that. Um, because a lot of our, our schools are dated in the area where PCBs uh, could come up. Um, and as you know, we have a high school already in the state that's vacant because of PCBs. Uh, the legislature passed this uh, required testing. And I don't know if Lisa's concerned about it in Randolph or not. But, uh, <laughs> I think if you're working in a school, you're not concerned about um, it. But there's no funding tied to currently right now of how to mitigate it. Um, if the if we're high and so I just I think there's all some significant unknown cost potentially for us in um, our facilities that we just have to keep a real close eye on um, so I think that 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 for me is is something that I'm I'm certainly cognizant of I think we just have to continue to prioritize this year If you're yeah. asking people to jump in. Go for it. Okay. I, I totally agree with that, but I would also say that um, since uh, Jamie has become our superintendent, there's been a real shift to investing in our teachers and investing in their professional development and really bringing the access to PD home so people aren't um, having to travel here and there and everywhere. And I think that's made some some nice beginning changes and I would love to see that to be continued as a priority um, because I think it's it's going to benefit the kids in the long run. Um, with the SA3 and SA2 and this money that's supplanting the local budget money, um, like I'd, I'd be a little concerned about not funding areas of the budget and then the next year you know like we no no we need to keep that, that in, in and yeah no, no we're not touching that yeah okay you know, that's how we can make certain what we're doing sustainable right um yes yeah, so no we're we would not be looking to change that and again we'll have to explain that why is revenue up you know why are right. we still budgeting the way we are and it's really to ensure we can be sustainable what we got so yeah no okay. i'm in complete agreement with what you're saying andrew okay um, the other thing I would bring up as we're going into budgeting is just it does seem like there's staffing shortages everywhere and are we going to need to budget more for staffing in order to be able to attract like it's one thing to budget for a position but if you can't fill it um, that's not real helpful so is that something we need to take into consideration as we go into budget? well we're opening negotiations of course uh, with our teaching staff. I think that the contract that we have with the support staff was a really positive one and ratified. So also support staff that they engage in professional development um, that we offer can see a buck raise next year, um, which is pretty significant uh, for us. I don't think we've done a buck raise an hour in, in a long, long time. Um, and so we did take that into account and we knew that we could budget accordingly for it. And that's why the the increase in pay was year two of that master agreement because we knew we could budget. So certainly Tara knows to be budgeting for that. Um, and then, like I said, we're going to be starting um, teacher contract negotiations, hopefully in the next couple months. Does anybody have anything else they want to add? I remember last year we really looked at our goals. Okay, you can raise your hand. Um, but we looked at our goals as a way to guide the budgeting process. And when I read through your report, I found myself thinking about like the MTSS and those pieces, if we were fully staffed, how those programs continue to develop 
Um, and so I'm just looking forward to, to that. So I'm glad to hear that we're still going to budget for those things. Um, and hopefully starting the hiring process early next year will fill some of those gaps. I don't know. <clears throat> Excuse me. No, I was just going to say, I think it's important in our budget that because we've got all the supplemental monies coming in, that we not really budget for any new continuing programs because once that extra money is gone, we're not going to have the money to keep those programs going. I think it's important that we do a lot of things that are one-time things that will really make a huge difference. Yeah, I agree, Peggy. Thank you. I think it's important, though, for us to continue to say that. And of course, um, in addition, when we think about, you know, the excitement around what Owen's going to talk to you about is we expect that that's going to bring in close to um, three quarters of a million dollars too over the next three years uh, for us to look to expand some things and do some exciting Thanks. Uh, community. What's the status of the of the RFQ uh, for, for? That is for out. Okay. Yeah. So that's good news. Uh, Tara, do you know how long um, folks had in that request? October eighth. Okay. There you go. So that's, yeah. No, yeah. We need to get that wrapped up too. Um, was that what you were looking for from us for? Yeah, I mean, I think my sense is, is that you want us to continue. I'm just going to paraphrase. You tell me if I got it wrong. <laughs> you start to me that you want us to continue to focus on investment of our goals. Uh, and part of that I, I did hear clearly, just so folks know, is looking at opportunities to expand child care and support. Um, both before and after school hours and in the summer. Um, that's a bigger conversation, of course, too, with One Planet, but I, I certainly have heard that. So that is something that I think we need to be looking at when we think about student support. Um, and, um, but doing it in a way that's sustainable. Um, and uh, so, you know, how do we strategically budget to keep programming, if not increase it? Um, but in a sustainable approach. Uh, that's what I'm hearing. Um, and of course, you know, as far as the tax rating things go, we find out a lot more about that as December approaches, of course, um, as we start to get projected yields, equalized pupils, things of that number. Right. Yeah. Um, I mentioned that they're going to resume the budget committee meetings. Does Finance committee. Finance they committee. have been happening. Oh, you have been happening. Yeah. Okay. Who's on it now? Uh, Eddie, me, um, Reed, Tara, um, Elise, Sarah Bird, and uh, um, I think it's Bob. Bob, Bob Gray's off, but Rob is on in right. place. Uh, Owen, you want to tell us about the community schools grant? I am happy to talk about that. What good news? How, it's not often we get to talk like this about this kind of good news, but I'll tell you. I, let me give you the first. There's a five. There's five points in structure that we that the agency laid out, and I'll just read them out to you, and you'll get to know this because I think we're going to be bringing it back to you a lot. So one is integrated student support. So how do we support students? So we do that a lot already, but this is to, to help su support that even more. Number two is expanded and enriched learning time and opportunities. So this is helping kids engage in after school, before school, out of school activity. This might even be some of that um, childcare stuff we were talking about. This does not just land in the middle school. This is a rud 
plan. It's starting in the middle school. Our plan is to, in the three years, to have the first year focused in the middle school and then add the, the rest of the pre-K-12 portions. And then also keep adding to those and join in with some of the SU partners. So the first one is supporting students. The second one is creating enrichment opportunities. And the third one is active family and community engagement. This is a piece where we know we can always increase and do better. So to have this kind of support is going to be lovely. The fourth one is collaborative leadership and practices. This plays right into the restorative practices work we've been doing, the work we've been doing, and that we would reach that into the community. And the fifth one is safe, inclusive, and equitable learning environments. Again, this is a great place for us to partner with the community. Our, as we saw with our recent anti-racist policy readings, that folks are very interested in the equity and safety and inclusion opportunities. One of the things that we are looking at and we put into the grant as an example is a community-wide book read or several of them where everybody in the community starting in Bethel, no matter who you are, whether you have kids in the school or not, we would get books, we would all read them and very much like the Bethel University model we would reach out and connect with each other and talk about the book and the subjects that are raised. So again, as much as it says Bethel this year, we're not looking at that as our only boundary. We're going right up into the other campus at the high school and into the elementary as we can. Just so you know, this um, and Tara and Jamie have been incredibly helpful. This is my the biggest grant I've ever been involved in this closely. And I'm really happy to say that um, I got a good team supporting me because I'm ready to spend the money. And they're like, there is no money yet. Slow down, dude. And it really helped for me because I'm a go-go guy. I don't know if you realize that. But the one big part of this annually is we hire a position that would coordinate this whole piece. And we put a good amount of money in there so we can attract somebody. And attracting somebody is going to be the key because we know there's not a lot of people available. So we need somebody that, and they've offered that you can have part-time, two different people, three different people, you just got to tell them how you're going to do it. But so that's a bunch of parts. I can tell you some more stuff. There's lots of cool, juicy things in there. One of the things that we put in there was ski and snowboarding that families would be able to go together maybe on weekends. Kids would go in the winter, like a full day during January, at least once a week. And so... How about that? We start there and I'll back down and let see if there's any questions or comments. They go for a full day once a week? Say it again. You said they go skiing a full day once a week? What's the hope? Yeah, in the middle school, we used to do that where, and then in that, that a full day would be spent at the mountain. And students, of course, there's a, a, some stuff about you having to have your work done on, done on in on time, at least made a major effort, depending on your abilities. That also wow. included rentals and a um, uh, safety training and a um, ski instructor. Okay. Um, Jamie, so one of the first things there was like student support. What could you elaborate on that a little bit? What do you mean? Sure. Yeah, it's a good one. So integrated student supports. And one of the ways we wrote our SMART goal was that by the end of year three, 50% of our students will meet the expectations in reading and math up from our very low numbers now. We still feel like that might be a low bar for us, but we're going to hit that bar. That's an example. So the way we might support that, Andrew, is to run an after-school academic club or to create summer boosters where kids could join into some sort of academic programming that also had a camp atmosphere. Then, with, like, I'm curious how we engage the kids that need to be engaged for that, that bring up the numbers. So part of one part of this grant that I really like is there's a call for a um, pretty comprehensive stakeholder group, including students. And part of that is, you know, the students and anybody, the community members, faculty, staff, whoever on that are going to receive a stipend for being on that committee. And one of the 
the things they're pushing and we know is really powerful is if students are helping make these decisions so we ask students and teachers and, fa and faculty and community members what's going to bring kids to this they're going to know and they're going to share it with us and we're going to then also reach out to students and give them some like sm for survey feedback of what would it take to engage you in a summer reading or math program and it might be that you very much like we do now you do a morning section of academics and an afternoon section of team building collaborative work Sorry, was there something in the chat or was it that... tammy had a question in the chat yeah. so you identified integrated student support expanded and enriched learning time and opportunities active family and community engagement collaborative leadership and practices but what was the fifth one safety and inclusion pardon safety and inclusion thank you safe a safe inclusion equitable learning environments so one of the things we're going to do at the front end of this is is gather information from people we're coordinating with uh a few of the bethel um initiatives that's that are going on right now because they're also there's two grants in bethel uh town proper that are to build community and we're going to work with those folks that have have received those grants and are managing them to try to weave our pieces together so we don't go out and ask people in the town the same questions three different times. Um, well, I'd be interested in seeing everything that went into the grant application or, you know, sure. share whatever you've got as far as what the implementation is actually going to look like. and. Yeah. Sure, I would love to do that. It might be something that I would work with Jamie and Tara on, and it could be maybe, I'm going to throw this out there without ever checking with anybody, maybe before the next board meeting, we do a little grant presentation. Okay. Uh, Peggy? Here we go. Um, I was just going to say that I've liked everything that I have heard, the opportunities that are going to be presented. My my concern is that when this grant is done, that we don't lose those things because we can't afford them anymore because we don't have the grant. What, what, what you need to do and we need to make sure of is that these things are sustainable. If we're talking about taking eighth graders to Washington, D.C., we not only want to do it this year, we want to do it every year because everybody should be able to do that. So we need to make sure that's something that we can sustain in our normal budgets when this grant is done. Couldn't agree more. And I have a new superintendent who won't let me do any less. <laughs> hey, yeah, yeah. He, but you know he that's heard this throughout the process. <laughs> he don't box me in, Bradley. Don't box me in. And you know, uh, it's a good point. And we know the high value of these things. And I couldn't agree more. One of the things we're talking about is, at least in the middle school, school trying to create some sort of uh, trip for, for each of them and getting it bigger, like you're going to ninth grade, your last trip at middle school, you go to DC. But there's some, we go to Hulbert with the seventh graders now and do some overnight stuff with them. And we're talking about a consideration for the sixth grade. And those things are important, as you know, and they do need to be built in. And Jamie's been really clear. You want something? Tell me what you can't have. And it's, a, it, you know, you got to balance the scales. I am so behind that. It was very embarrassing to be a part of that, that budget that ended up in red ink. And I look forward to never living that life again. We're also had this conversation in the grant uh, or shared this in the grant that we want to honor our elders. You know, the majority of Vermonters now are, are gray haired people. I know them well. I see one in the mirror every morning. And these folks have, not me, these folks have so much information that's just sitting there at home. We want them to come into our schools and us to go into their settings and learn from them. The idea may be that everybody has an elder mentor or we have some sort of honor, maybe even monthly, that they come in for lunch and that we learn from them. So it's pretty exciting. And 
I think that's important to bring people into that kind of stuff and not just be done with people. So we're pretty excited about it. Thanks for your work on it. Um, does anybody else have questions or comments? All right. There will be. Kevin. Oh, and did you just, did you thank the faculty that also worked on this? I did very much so. Uh, Tony Snow was very instrumental in this, just so you know. And uh, Anda was very helpful. There was a heavy lift. and. Folks came up with ideas and some details, and they have been thanked. But thank you for reminding me on that, Jamie. Yeah, I just wanted to do it publicly. Thanks. Um, when did you hear about this grant, or like, how did we get the idea to apply for it? Well, the agency put it out in uh, either late July or early August, and it was due August twenty-seven. So, no, it was August seventeenth. I'm sorry. We had about a two week, uh, 10 day turnaround on it. And it was ended up being 25 pages. And, and we, we got it in. I actually pushed the button for it to go in at 3.59 on the day it was due at four o'clock. And, uh, and then they told us that we were awarded this on September 1st. This was a major fast turnaround from some federal money that ended up at the agency. And it's also really a pilot because right now out of, um, there's a group up at um, Shelburne Farms is that organizing a way for the five groups, five schools that got this money to get together and learn about how to create community school uh, institutions and also how to work together. So it's been a fast turn. This has been like really fast. Meanwhile, we opened school and we're living in a pandemic. Yeah. Wow. Thanks so much for putting in the effort. It's great. Um, okay, well, the next thing was going to be the student representatives on the board, and this was just here so we could meet you guys, but we have met you, so thank you for coming on the board. We're very pleased to be able to hear from the students and have you guys be with us. Andrew, just real quick, we had talked about the students being on reports to the board when um, we talked about bringing them back, so I know that um, Principal uh, McCracken, sorry, it's called even Cormac. It's Principal McCracken. Um, it's getting late, I guess. The uh, kind of prepped you for tonight. I would like to sit down too, and we'll just talk about. I would really like you to have a monthly report that you can provide the board, um, so that there's really some purpose around you being here. And I think we'll get better as we go to ensure that your voice is is incorporated into the conversation and that the the work is relevant to you. Um, as well. So just know that. And thanks. As we get better about this, I hope that you'll find that it's that it's it, it you're really feeling like you're part of the conversation. I'm not saying you weren't tonight, but I'm just saying I think we'll get better and better about it. We have yet to kind of discuss anything in student council. Like All right, cool. So let's yeah, let's connect and we'll talk about that. Um, and feel free to you know raise your hand or whatever during the meeting if you have questions or comments that you want to. Bring up during the discussion. So, you guys are here to, here to be part of it. So, um, thank you. All right, outdoor classroom time during COVID 19. Um, so, I, I, I know that there's, you know, a concern and continues to be a concern about our mitigation efforts to COVID 19. I think we've leveraged outdoor learning well um, last year. You know, I think we, we've learned a lot from that. I would say that we're indoors more this year than we were last year. I would just acknowledge that. Um, and, you know, I think our data in general, do we continue to track it? Um, knock on wood, we've had no issues in any buildings in our NRSU so far this year, except for this one. Um, and um, we do know that outdoors is the safest place to be. Um, the data just speaks to that. And so, I did uh, talk to Principal Bowen to highlight some things that are going on in the elementary level right now. And also knowing that I think one of the issues that we really are navigating and dealing with is lunchtime, um, just so you know. And um, how do we navigate lunchtime, stay within the master agreement, um, 
and ensure that we're, we're keeping kids really safe, right? And so that is something that I would say that we're continuing conversations on. Um, again, we've just brought in another staff person that we've just onboarded that will start at the Royalton campus next week, actually two of them. So that's helping um, as we start to increase staffing levels. Um, and I think we'll be able to do some more creative things once we get those staffing levels up too. Uh, but uh, Principal Bowen, you want to jump in? Yeah, I mean, I think you said a lot of it. We have tried to make sure that there are accessible outdoor spaces for any of the classes that want to be outside. Um, I know in Bethel, just because of the canopy that goes around the, the elementary, they opt for just having access to that and didn't ask for tents. I think in Royalton, we have four tents. Um, and um, so those are available for those classes to be outside. I think briefly surveying about, about how much time people are outside, I think on average, most classes are outside for an hour a day uh, for learning and play. Um, but on eco days, it can range up to three hours or more depending. So I think the layout of the Bethel campus allows for eating outside easier. The layout of the Royalton campus is harder to get with trays and little people outside easy. Um, but I, I think that people want to be outside. This is an easy time of year to be outside, easier time of year to be outside. Um, and I think the elementary teachers are still also trying to balance the, it's the first six weeks of school and we're trying to learn how to be in school. So um, I appreciate the, the concern about wanting to maybe be outside more and maybe having a protocol around when certain things happen, maybe when we would want to push out a little bit more. So I look, look forward to that kind of direction. Owen? Yeah, um, I personally spent two and a half hours outdoors today. I was lucky to be able to cover a pod setting in the woods, and the kids taught me all about their uh, campsite. And I figured, Jamie asked us this today, and I'm estimating about seven to eight hours outdoors for kids. And it's not all at once, of course, and it's chunks, and it depends on the weather, and we are just in. I think one of the things for me with us being in right now, we're being really, the kids and faculty are amazingly good at this. And schools are about wearing masks and, and disinfecting. I feel like we're doing an amazing job. And we all want to be out more than we are, trust me. <laughs> but we'll continue to get outside. Oh, if I can just jump in too, I think a, a really important point is that the positivity that we're seeing, I can't confirm in building spread at this point. So some of the positivity that we're seeing is community spread. I think that the more we can emphasize to our community that we need to be masked and still diligently um, working to be careful. I think there's a lot of guard let up. Um, and, you know, in general, the data points to that in school is some of the safest time. Uh, whether we're in or out, but that what we're seeing is is folks contracting in the community and then coming into school um, positive. Um, and then students are identified as close contacts and we send students home and then they have to get tested. Um, but in general, at this point, I can't confirm in school um, contraction that occurred uh, in or spread. Um, we've had it in the past. Um, in one in one building, but in general, the um, spread seems to you know our mitigation techniques certainly work, uh, and I'm certainly glad that we came back masked. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, I mean just informally polling my own kids. I mean, I think the only time they're spending outside is recess each day. And then the eco class once a week. Uh, um, so I mean, and I think other parents have, you know, I think they ask their kids the same thing, and they and I hear comments about, you know, why aren't they spending more time outside? And I think especially with some of these having to go remote for COVID, like especially like the, I guess it was the, the kindergarten here just with the amount of time that's being spent indoors and then it deems everybody as close contact. So while there's not any transfer in the building, 
you now have, I don't know how many kids are in the kindergarten, but let's say 15 kids, that's 15 families that are getting impacted by that and, uh, and have to, you know, make adjustments. And for some families, they have support networks that can help out with that. And then for other families, they don't. Uh, and, and it's, and it's a stressful for all of them, but especially for the people that, you know, don't have any support beyond, you know, their own, you know, uh, direct family that's, you know, their kids in the school and then their, them and their spouse or significant other. And, and it creates a lot of stress. And I think, you know, they're wondering, are there ways to, again, get outdoors more and, and sort of limit the level of, mm -hmm. you know, what classifies as close contact. But, and I don't know, I mean, I think maybe the staffing, again, goes to the, you know, part of that where we just can't go outside enough to, to really avoid it because of staffing and being able to keep an eye on the kids. But I think looking back to things that were happening last year to try to make sure that they stayed outdoors and, and limited contact times, but, you know, if there were strategies that could come back in, I think people would be happy to hear about that. So I would say, and Andrew, you can jump in. I think we we went into this year really organizing ourselves that we would limit close contact to a grade level. I would say we're probably never going to mitigate the risk of if someone comes in very positive in the elementary, we're going to deem that grade level a close contact. Um, I also think the definition of close contact is is four hours and that's a long day to be outside. And I think we're also telling our teachers, we want them to raise their test scores and we want them to use some of these programs for fidelity, which do kind of need some technology maybe, or um, it's just easier to employ inside. So, um, you know, while I'm not saying it's not doable, if, if the shift, I feel like last year the priority was just trying to be in school and be as normal as possible. I feel like this year the the shift was to try to like really raise the bar and raise our test scores. Um, so a close contact definition and trying to stay outside enough to not meet that, I think would be a challenge. Right, that's what I was going to finish with. And I would also just say that as far as, um, just trying to navigate the primary grades, K-1-2, outside and provide explicit instruction is really challenging. Um, so I would agree that I think we need to break out the day. I think we need to get kids outside in fresh air as much as possible. Um, and I think we need to continue those conversations. But I do think in order to provide explicit instruction, especially to our youngest grades, it's really challenging outside. Um, not to have them distracted. And frankly, your cohorts are getting bigger. Um, you know, you have a, a first grade class in South Burlington that I believe has got what, 19, Andrew? That, I mean, that, that right there, that's, you know, it's exciting that we have cohorts of 19, 20 again, but 19 or 20 with one teacher are trying to actually teach outside is just challenging. Um, one they are inside or we, making sure windows are open and like we're doing what we can to prevent the yeah no we still are trying to do all those precautions and again I, I think that those are working um if if we're noticing spread that's happening within our buildings then i think we need to dig into our protocols again but I, that's right now i have every reason to believe students are contracting outside the building and bringing it in uh, and I think that that's an important thing for folks to realize. And the more we can be diligent as a community, I think the less we're going to hit these pause buttons. So that means so far the mitigation efforts that are happening in school seem to be effective. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Do you think it's important that we keep our eye on the ball, though? You know, like we kind of have an end game in sight if the vaccines kind of are able to get to the lower age group, then I think it'd be okay to, you know, like that should be happening soon. And then we don't have to worry quite so much about the spread. But like right now, you know, our numbers are as high as they were black and at the peak before. And it's 
a higher percentage of kids that are contracting it. So, you know, the risks seem to be more than they were last year. Um, but so if we could kind of buckle down for a month or two, then hopefully things will be easier after that. Yeah, I would say that in general, our in-person learning hasn't changed much other than the, the eating, right? And that's why I brought that up. That is the biggest change from what we were doing last year. Um, and so that is, if I can get staffing enough up enough to cover duties, then that will make it easier for us to try to change maybe what our procedures look like. Um, I would tell you that that is, to me, the biggest difference in our procedures right now is how lunch is happening. Um, and I've got concerns about that too. Okay. Tammy? So, Audra, I really appreciated your comment. You know, the definition of close contact is four hours, which is a long time to potentially be outside. And at the same time, teachers are being asked to raise test scores. Doing both is difficult. But then we keep talking about lunch and staffing. And I don't understand the, the hurdle here about lunch. Um, and then in having that you know, concern, lunch and staffing, and then knowing last year we had um, potentially emergency procedures in getting food to the classrooms, but now all of that is or isn't in existence. I'm having a hard time as a public community member understanding the lunch concern, knowing the hurdles that we overcame last year um, and how they look this year, because this year is different. We're not in a state of emergency. We don't have those education mandates, but I don't understand how lunch looks different this year aside from they can now use the cafeteria. Can someone clarify that? that that's the biggest difference, Tammy. And I would say we were at full staff last year. I'm much shorter staffed this year than I was a year ago. Um, so I was able to cover duties differently um, to ensure that students could eat in the classroom, where now we're having to utilize eating outside, which is good, and or in the cafeteria, because uh, I don't have the staff to, to provide coverage both for lunch and for recess and ensure that my teachers get what they deserve in regards to a lunch break, uh, which is part of the master agreement. And so that's that's the hurdle around lunch. OK, thank you. Andrew, do you want to jump in in addition to that? Yeah, I, I think that the state of emergency really was di a, you know added a different layer to this last year. And I know that I hear people saying, like, this still feels very emergent to them, given their kids are in school. But last year, teachers were willing to sign a memorandum of understanding so that they did some things outside of their teacher contract. Like, they were willing to be potted with their classes all day. And so they were happy to eat lunch with their children. So they literally stayed with their kids for lunch and brought their own kids out to recess. And um, we're not operating under that same MOU that we were with teachers. So they do have a right to a duty-free lunch. And so that means I have to have some people on recess duty and some people inside covering the lunch duty. And there's not enough people to cover separate lunch duties, which is, I think, what Jamie said. But just, it, it seems like it should be simple, but it's it's not as simple as I wish it was. Um, it's also worth noting that uh, to get some tax savings and level fund last year, we also eliminated a number of para positions. Uh, and some of those, or at least on each campus, those paras were helping to provide elementary lunch and recess coverage. But even in addition to that, we still, I think, could do it if I was staffed fully with paras. I mean, we have a number of paras we still need that are special ed paras that can do those duties that we just haven't filled. Is the specials part of it where you had special teachers that weren't kind of doing like a lot of the special things were happening that certainly the helped with the pods and navigating some of that as well right thank you for explaining the mous the teachers um you know that additional uh, responsibility that the teachers took on um in that in that period of time. Um, it's helpful in understanding the broader picture here.
Um, was the MOU a statewide thing or a local thing? Local thing. Would it be possible to uh, just for a couple of months talk to them about another MOU? Because as I said, like I think once the vaccines are available to the student, whole student population, a lot of this will be less urgent for parents anyway. I certainly could. I would again caution the board that I think our teaching staff is <laughs> pretty thin. Yeah. Um, and we've had resignations already this year across the SU, and I just think we have to be a bit cautious of what more we're asking them to do. Okay. All right. Um, any, do you have anything else for the outdoor classroom? All right, we'll move on to the vacant board representation. So, uh, so we've had two um, uh, committee members from Bethel. Chris Jarvis and Rodney Rainville have reached out uh, with interest in serving on the board until the next election uh, for a representative of Duffel. Um, and I can get out of the way. And I thought that the board could just allow them to introduce themselves, their interest in to, as to why. And then if you guys had questions, and then you could go into executive session and come out on the point. That's been our process in the past. I'll get out of the way. Um, you like to go first? Yeah, I can. I, I just had a couple of things that I typed up like a couple minutes long, but um, and first of all, can you hear me from way over here? But, um, so my name is Chris Jarvis, if you don't know me. Um, I'm a lifelong Vermonter, uh, 15 years in the town of Bethel. Um, the, uh, you know, I have two bachelors of science degrees. Uh, I'm just pointing that out because of the last uh, meeting I was kind of Boss by that, but um, the I have three daughters, one that graduated in 2020, and two that are currently in middle school. Um, I'm a very active uh, community member, uh, both at the school and the town. Uh, some examples of that is uh, coaching and donating my time through the youth sports program over the last 15 years. Uh, middle school coaching uh, basketball for five years. Uh, I'm an active parent when it comes to field trips and other school related activities. Um, I've worked with Principal Bowen um, over the last 11 years to donate holiday meals for elementary families in need. Um, I actually ran for school director in 2012, which uh, won by majority of votes, but had to pull my name due to conflict of interest due to basketball. Um, I'm currently the ranking member of the select board and the chair of the select board in town, and I've been on the select board since 2016. Um, I have a ton of board-related experiences and committee-related experiences. I have a lot of experience when it comes to budgeting and financials. Um, I believe in representing all citizens and not pushing my own selfish agenda. Um, anybody that has worked with me or been on a board with me knows that the people come first. I don't, you know, I don't go on there thinking that I'm pushing an agenda. Um, I typically represent what I call the majority of the citizens. Uh, which tend to be the silent majority of the, the citizens. Um, and for anybody who doesn't know what the silent majority is, is, uh, is a majority of citizens in our community that rarely talk openly about um, the issues that they see in the community. And they often don't vote. Um, you know, we, we have uh, 2,000 people in the town of Bethel, of which about 200 people vote a year. So it's, it's a very small amount. Um, and, uh, I, I have a lot of conversations with the silent majority through town and school activities. Uh, and some of the concerns that they have are as follows. Um, the silent majority has a lot of concerns with the school in regards to the financial path of the school and the tax relationship uh, to them. The silent majority has a lot of concerns when it comes to the education of the children and the low test, current low test scores that we have. The silent majority has concerns in regards to the faculty and student family turnover ratios that's, that we see right now. Um, the South majority has concerns in regards to the current COVID policies and the inconsistencies of the policies. Um, the South majority has uh, concerns in regards to just the overall school board functionality, um, not making the tough decisions, lack of transparency, and not being trustworthy. 
the silent majority has concerns in regards to the teaching of critical race theory and or any part of it with their children. The silent majority has concerns in regards to bullying, harassing, both physically and sexually in our schools. And, and the silent majority at the same time has a confusion of why we can't just have a comprehensive approach to addressing all of these, um, including racism, rather than do it separately. Um, I'm, I'm here because uh, my children uh, education depends on it and uh, the silent majority uh, reasons um, because they often don't speak up for themselves. So um, if you have me, if not, I, I probably will run in March. But thank you. Okay, uh, well, I'm Rodney Rangel uh, from Bethel. You all well know me. Uh, I was on the merger committee for three years. And I was on the school board for three years, and uh, I decided not to run for re-election last year due to some personal issues I was having. Uh, it was a rough year for different things, and uh, but I think I've, uh, I'm over that hump now, and things are going along pretty smoothly, other than the media that I need to replace next month. But uh, my policies haven't really changed much when I worked with you last year. And uh, I think I can be an asset to the community. That's how it is. Any more questions for the candidates? Um, I was wondering, because I was not on here last year, what exactly your policies were, like the brief overview of them? Because I was just curious. Well, I, I, I tend to be a moderate. Um, what, what the students first, and I do have budget concerns also. Uh, I like to consider all angles, I guess, so before I make a decision. And uh, I don't know. It's uh, I like the direction that things are going right now in the school. Um, it's, I think there has been some improvement over the last couple of years. <coughs> I can't think of a dark light on anything in particular that I made decisions on. Well, 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 well. Um, no, I, I, yeah, I guess I guess students first would be my policy, and then um, budget next. Right. Chris, can you um, be more specific about what your degrees are in? You said they're in healthcare. Yeah, I, I kind of only just uh, mentioned them uh, because I, I did have some questions at the last school board meeting, and apparently the people that spoke after me put their credentials first, and it seemed like uh, that your opinions mattered more. Um, so I have two um, bachelor's of self, uh, science degrees, uh, one specifically in health science, which is a pre-medical degree. And the other one, which is in sports medicine. And both were through the University of Castleton. Yeah, I will say it was a concern of mine that you spoke at that last meeting with, with a pretty um, specific point of view. And then when other people started speaking, you left. And that doesn't say to me that you're very willing to hear other people's points of view. I'm not sure if you want to respond to that. Uh, at, the, at the last meeting, I had very limited service. I actually was on my phone. Um, so I got on just with the public comment to voice my concerns of the matter. I actually did listen to the two uh, ladies that had the other two public comments, and then I had gotten off after that. I think if you talk to any of my constituents in regards to the town, um, town manager, any of the select board members, they'd know that that um, you know I've never once put any of my one ideas before the committee, rather than uh, people as a whole. So. And you say you speak for a silent majority, which you speak of like it's a specific group. Can you tell us how many are in this majority? Do you have a 
that concerns me that you have this possible agenda that that you're saying is coming from a, a group. I, I think but there's um, no identification if, of them. Um, first, I, I would say to answer that question, you know, for anybody that's been in the community of Bethel for a period of time, um, they know that there are individuals that that talk and have concerns and they talk privately amongst themselves, which is the majority of people. And then there are the few of us like myself that actually have the courage to present those ideas towards a group. Um, and those are the differences. We see that every day. I mean, a majority of people in life don't want to speak up, um, but they will speak privately to others. And, and I have conversations with people through all walks of life, um, to town or, or just normal life. Um, these things come up all the time. Um, I mean, I think, I think everybody should have the right to voice their own feelings and opinions, uh, because that's the only way we are able to work together as conceive, uh, together as a group. If, you know, if we don't bring our own opinions and uh, forward, it, you know, it, it's kind of a dull group of, you know, not uh, getting enough ideas in there to make decisions with. Um, and, and I think that we would absolutely agree that people have a right to speak their mind and, and share their opinions and we're happy to hear them. Um, I would also say that change is made by the people who show up. And so, you know, if there are opinions, I, I would hope that you would urge people to come and speak for themselves. Are there any more questions for the candidates? Okay. Um, we can go into our executive session now. Um, how do we want to do this? I think you should just um, move to go into executive session. It would just be the board, um, and the rest of us would leave. Right? That should um, work, right? You just we, could do the, we could do the public comment real quick. Yeah, so if you'd like to do that, sure. Yeah. Then I think everybody can go. <laughs> um, so we're going to jump to the final public comment. Is there any public comment at this time? Danny? Hi. Um, I am participating in these meetings as much as I can from a community member perspective, and I really appreciate that much of the administration knows the ESSER or ESRIP or um, the, the grants that go with that. Um, as a community member, I'm really confused by the ESSER 1 and the ESSER 2. Is there a resource I can talk to read about to learn more about that? is my first question, and I don't know if I should pause to hear a response on that or if I should ask my second question at the same time. Um, I can say that there's some EFDA videos, that's the Vermont School Board Association, that go over the various grants that um, I could forward to you if you're interested. Um, it's all kind of technical, but um, it, it goes over the different COVID relief grants that have come out and specifically what they were for and, and where they came from. Um, if that's something you want to look at. Yes, um, those, it sounds like it reads like stereo instructions, which would be delightful for me. And I mean that, I like those things. Um, thank you, Andra, for providing the link. <laughs> um, so that was my first question and I'll try to get that link quick. The second question is that I find the, the um, the business manager, Tara, does a great job of presenting her information. And as many times as I try to write it down to capture the information and actually look at the numbers, I can't. Um, and as a community member who doesn't attend every single meeting, I don't know how the community can stay caught up on those updates. Is there any suggestions the board members can give um, so that community members can kind of follow that better i do understand that in a public setting meeting not all data needs to be um, listed on the handout the update that tara provides to the board but i continue to find myself at a loss in trying to talk through, to make sense of it uh, i think have the um 
the projections that she was providing were um, particularly helpful in that it was a two pager and had a kind of more digestible summary of what was going on um, with the budget and current spending and stuff. Um, so I think that's one to look for, and that's usually included in the packet when it's available. Um, and I think we're talking about having that quarterly available. Um, you know, I think this, what she provided this time was um, kind of a very detailed view of things, but we're hoping that we'll get a summary that will be more digestible um, in the future. Um, so I, I, that's, that's what I would comment is that, that sometimes there are these detailed things, but we are going to try and provide a quarterly more digestible summary of how things are looking. Um, Shannon, did you have something? So I was, I was going to um, say, I think that a lot of different people come to our school website for a lot of different reasons. And um, one of those reasons is, that would be great to have, you know, as a little box on the side is, hey, how are we doing budget wise this year? Because that's why everyone comes to the town meeting every year, right? And the townspeople want to know and they have a right to know. So if maybe we can work with Tara that that quarterly we put up a blurb, whatever that blurb is, you know, we're on track on the budget or we're running a little bit of a surplus right now. But remember, you know, this is coming up or we're, you know, God forbid we're running a deficit, but here's how we're going to address it. And some of those things that might be a nice place to put it um, so that people can come and, and see what's happening. And some of the initiatives like, Hey, we got this grant and we're going to be doing this community project, and some of the money stuff like in one column would be nice. Um, yeah. Yeah, that might be something for the finance committee to work on with her. Yeah, something in close to as close to English as possible. <laughs> right. I, I think you all are trying, and um, I appreciate it. I don't want to reinvent the wheel. You all have enough work to do. I just um, the insight you provide has been helpful. So thank you. That's a good comment, then. Thanks. So okay, I. I Go wasn't ahead. here for board comment, so I want to ask one little tiny question um, while we're doing public comment, if that is okay. Go for it. Okay. Hey, Ray. <laughs> and, yeah. and maybe principals, how come we got a blue form that has to be filled out for medical that looks like exactly the same questions we already filled out? And is that getting fixed for next year, please? You want me to answer that? Sure. <laughs> I can answer that. I assume uh, it's the question everybody answered wrong, but go ahead. No, it, we did have an issue uh, with one of the questions and how folks understood it. Uh, I would also say that the back side of it didn't print for the health, that particular health form well. So there was some concerns in the nursing department about something getting messed up because of that. And so, yes, uh, we did meet uh, even again on Friday during in-service to talk about how can we ensure that this is operating at a distinguished level for next year. Great. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. Because everything we can do to reduce parent abrasion. Yay. So we'll just roll, I guess there's another board comment because I didn't comment on earlier, but I would follow up on that and just say I did like the, the whole form the family ID stuff and the way that it did remember things. So, you know, I thought that was yeah, a way to well. one kid that again, I was going to have to like copy and paste stuff from the previous time. So I had like a little Word document going with, with stuff to copy and paste, but then how it remembered those things. Um, so it was very, it was very slick to, to work with after you got through like one kid and started to realize some of the, the ability that it had after that. I think, yeah. So, it was a good first go at it, I would say. But yeah, that, 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 having that having that form come home again uh, was was uh, semi-traumatizing. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, uh, uh, nurses generally don't work in the summer and a lot of the work leading up to the end uh, happened during the summer. And in that case, the paper form did not translate well to the online version. Yeah, there were a few fields that looked like that, like the some of those questions were there on the online one, but there was a couple things that maybe weren't there, like especially like I think there was some maybe something about the like like I my needs and I forget what questions, but it seemed like there was a couple of questions that did. So the nurses across the SU did do some edits to the form last week okay. that went out recently. Good. Okay. Yep. Uh, what? Well, excuse me. I was just going to say that not being as technologically advanced as some people, I had a horrible time dealing with all these different computer forms for sports or for the health through the general registration. I really wanted paper. <laughs> I agree I that the sports one is still particularly hard to use. You have to print it off and then put it back. That one uh, is yeah, tough. Horrible. Yep. Peggy, uh, we, we always have a paper option. I'm not, well, I'm not sure how that didn't get translated. Sorry, when I asked the athletic person about a paper option for the athletic registration, I was told there was no paper option. Sorry, I wasn't, I was speaking about everything but uh, athletics. Yeah, uh, we have actually had people come into school and we help them fill them out. Uh, it's got to be a special appointment, of course. No, I'm being serious. And that we will make that happen. And anybody that has a barrier to, to filling out forms, that's really easily fixed. And, and we'll help you. And I think I, you said it, Shannon, where it's like, it's getting better. So. Yeah. Well, I think if, if that's an option, we should explicitly state it in whatever we send out. So that people know, you know, if I'm having trouble getting it to work on the computer, I can come into the school or whatever. Um, and there were a couple of, I think the more that we can document what we want the parents to do, um, kind of going through the steps, like the screenshots and things, because there were a couple of times where, you know, getting from one student back to where you needed to get to for the next student wasn't crystal clear um, so you know, or which forms were required wasn't necessarily clear um, yeah yeah the more we can be explicit about exactly what we want people to do and the steps they need to take the better thank you but so much better than last year and hopefully we can be more clear on if you want paper forms, here's the number to call or want to come in. Yeah. Um, one other question would be, um, right now those are kind of a sign up thing, but it's not directly tied into kind of where our contact information and stuff is for when Blackboard happens. Like that. If people want to change the way that they're doing black you know, getting their notifications or something like that they still need to contact the school or can they do it through the family ID stuff no uh family id is separate from what the school what the school is what we use to manage student records and that's what information goes to blackboard so um we're a list child's of sixth grader Right. So if you, you should have an online account where you can log in and make those adjustments. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> but call the office in the meantime. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. As, as someone who thinks of myself as a pretty savvy and computer literate person, I don't know what my web to school account is. And I would kind of assume that when I fill out all of that paperwork and I give you my address and my phone number and my email, that that's the way you'll contact me this year. So if it's not, we need to be really clear about that um, in case people have moved and just assume that that they've updated. So um, ordinarily, I think that um, I'll call it an onboarding letter for like new sixth grade parents would have gone out by now, but Given a, given a number of challenges this year, uh, there's been a delay. 
Well, Owen knows that my brain is fried and I was a sixth grade parent two years ago. We've had COVID since then. I have no idea what my web to school stuff says. So <laughs> I haven't moved and I still have the same cell phone. So I think we're okay, but I'm just, I'm a little uncomfortable because families probably think that they're updating their information through family ID or, and it's, it's not the same thing. So we it's might not want to the same thing, but technically them you know. are. Technically you are updating. It's just not updating like in real time. So we okay. will take family ID and update update our information. It just doesn't okay. instantly update. Okay, good. That's and if that's I'm right. lying, you tell us, Ray. I'm sorry if I said the wrong thing. But I think I, that's how I believe it to be. <laughs> Hundred percent accurate, Principal Bowen. Okay. Great. All right. It's just we have to manually do it. Okay. Andrew, right. if you need me for a couple hours of like volunteer type, and, like yeah, that was gonna be my entry. follow up. And we, when we say we, it's none of us, FYI. <laughs> All right. Um, I think we can go into executive session at this point. Just before we go into executive session, so I'm just sitting here after some of the comments made by one of the board members. And I'm really feeling disrespected and personally attacked and unfairly labeled. And I would say anybody that knows me knows that I'm not that way. And there's six years of select board ORCA videos that you can go back through and you can watch them all and you can see exactly what my character is. Um, as well as superintendent has been, you know, we have invited him into a CR meeting and he knows exactly how our meetings are and the healthy function, uh, you know, feel good atmosphere, how we all come together as, as a team and work through everything. So I, I was really sitting here after that, really taken back by the comments that were said there, especially when, you know, Rodney and I are just, you know, trying to do our civic duties, fill in, help the board out, and be personally attacked like that. I really, I just really felt disrespected. I wanted to get that out there before we go. So thank you. Thank you, Brian, for coming in tonight. Yeah. So you guys should move to go into executive session. Just remember over personnel, mm -hmm. and then you come out, and then you'll make an appointment. Okay. okay. All right. Alex, I think we'll go. So I'll make a motion that we go into executive session for a personnel matter. Second. Yeah. 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 We marked off. Yeah. We leave now. No, no, yeah. That's Rodney's application um, to the board. Um, you can go to you, um, putting in there. Um, your application and um, Chris, I need you to still come to meetings and express your review, and I'd be happy to talk to you about some of the concerns that you raised, um, you know, individually anytime. Um, so. Thanks for coming out. And a lot of our um, decision came down to just being familiar with Rodney and him being on the board and having experience before. And so, um, really Both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations, Rodney. Yeah. Uh, Rodney, just uh, make sure you get sworn in. Okay. Have a good evening. Thank you. Yeah, check in with the town clerk and she'll get you all taken care of. It's a little different. You might not remember. Right at town meeting, uh, they tried to catch us before we left. Okay, so what would I do? I have to actually stop in? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when would I do that? Before the next Just, meeting? Yeah, before the next meeting. Okay. You guys are risking next year. <laughs> Working with you again. Yeah. I'll probably actually have to check in virtually there for the next couple months. Thank you, Rodney. Um, Thank you. Have a good nice day. to see you back. Any of this on Dan, any of the subcommittees, like the facilities or financials or anything? Uh, 
know. Uh, what do we get? Is there a need in, in, or like a lack in any of the committees or? Not that I know. About. They're pretty well built. Yeah, I mean, it's not like the finance committee is a good crew. Uh, policy committees also. Uh, I'll have to reestablish my email. Mm -hmm. And probably would go to full board meetings too as they come along. Great. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Riley. Yeah, I'm good. Peggy, I see your uh, your manager watches over your shoulder the same way mine likes to. My gosh, would you just? Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> yeah, not, not only be a part of it, but get right in the middle of it. So I did have another executive session for personnel. Okay. I don't think it'll take too, too long. Okay. Um, but if we can do that, that would be All right. great. Let's do it. Motion to enter executive session for personnel. We'll make a motion to enter executive session for a personnel matter. I second it. Inviting Jamie. All right. So that was 8 Executive session at 906 with no action taken. Um, the next meeting date is Tuesday, October 19th, 2021, at 6 p.m. at Royalton. Can we talk about that, please? Andrew, yes. we have a game that night. So. Either do the same thing that we did tonight and have the meeting start late, or um, I mean, we would have a forum with just four, uh -huh. or we can uh, move the meeting to the following Wednesday. I mean, the, the following week, we're done. The 19th is our last week of soccer. So the following week, we're completely done. It's just with both of our kiddos on the same team. Up it to like 6 30 and then when you guys get there we get there and we can start we'll have a quorum anyway we can leave with the reports okay. like tonight yeah, I'm fine. Yes, okay. fine. it's in setford at yes, five so we may not be there till seven or so. okay we'll make all the five it'll be done yeah Six fifteen mm -hmm. and half an hour back so we'll be we back start at 6 30 we'll be back at 6 45 or so mm -hmm. All right. Is that you. okay for you guys? Right. I'm happy to get it over. Okay. It'll be in Royalton, so you get a little bit closer. Yeah. Sure. True. Right? True. Yeah. yeah. Andrew just can't ride the bus that night. Has to be John. I'm sure you're torn up about it. Um, all right. Entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Third. Third.